Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. So today, as you can see, we have a very special guest. Uh, if you do not know, his name is Chi King. Right. Yeah, Hi. so he has a YouTube channel where he talks about Alibaba all the time. <laughs> not all the time, but yeah, most of the time. <laughs> so Chi King, many of us know that you are an Alibaba bull. But right. what's one fun fact that not many people know about you? I, I'm not too sure whether most of you know that I'm still a student. So I'm currently still studying in a university in Singapore. And uh, I, I guess I guess that's a fun fact. Um, not, I, I guess not a lot of students are on this platform because it seems like investing is kind of like an adult thing to do. Uh, yeah. But I, I took the leap of faith and I thought that since I enjoy doing what I'm doing and sharing my experiences and my thoughts online, and of course, inevitably, I get I get quite a lot of negativity as well, right? So it is where it is and I, I see where I can take this um, um, next time as well. Yep. And, and in return, you got 10,000 subscribers now. I guess you can put it <laughs> that way. <laughs> so can you share like, what's your investment journey like? Right. I think currently, um, I'm invested for probably around four years, give or take. I started in year two of army. So why did I start in army? Um, for those of you who are in Singapore, you should know that we have this um, conscription basis. I, I was in army for two years. I don't really know what I was doing. Um, there, were, there were a lot of free time and a lot of downtime. So I started reading quite a lot of books. Uh, then that was when it started. I, I started getting intrigued into investing and uh, I start, started reading all your very standard what rich that poor that intelligent investor, those kind of one hour Wall Street kind of stuff. Then after that, um, I, I think I was exposed to the investing world at quite a young age because my dad is quite a, a avid investor. He started investing in quite I think in his early in his early thirties as well. Wow. So then, then he he kept talking to me about investing um, since young, and to me, the you know the first few stocks that I bought, I, I started venturing into Singapore stock exchange as well. So the first few stocks I bought was your government backed stocks. So like your DBS, your Capital Corp, and then your Sam Corp industry where you see it everywhere. And then I know that I, I bought the stock not because I like the stock. Or I think that because of valuation or I think it's cheap. I bought it because I know that um, Singapore will never let it fall. So that's why I buy the stock. So, so that was how I started. And then I think in the 2020 COVID crash, um, I was the type that um, buy and didn't sell. So I, I held true. When it crashed, I think DBS at its lows was like 10 plus as well. Then uh, I, I held true. And then when, I, when, when it kind of recovered, I, I thought that I wanted more volatility. So I, I, I sold out all my Singapore, uh, Singapore stocks and then I went into the US and the Hong Kong exchange. Then um, yeah, then it is where it is today. And I'm, I'm kind of all in into, not all in, I said almost all in into <laughs> Alibaba. So yeah, that, that was my journey thus far. Actually, it's not that all in, right? I saw your portfolio is like 35%. Uh, I, I think now, if because I, I most of the, the entire position in Alibaba, I think is around 70 to 80%. Okay. Then I still have a few ETF exposure. and uh, But the ETF, I, I, I do have a Vanguard total. So Vanguard total, I think a majority of it is in S&P 500. But uh, it kind of still exposed myself to, to the world, world companies as well. I think there's like six 7,000 holdings or something. Then there is another one that I hold, and another ETF is KWEB. So KWEB is the China tech sector. So maybe I, my exposure is probably nearer to 85% if I were to really just count Alibaba on the aggregate. So it's not really all in. Almost all in. <laughs> in your, these four years of investment, have right. you made any mistake other than Alibaba? Right. I, I think uh, for, for Singapore stocks, thankfully, a lot of the companies that I bought are all your very strong hold companies. Yeah. So I, I didn't really make, I didn't really lose any money there. Um, and, and especially they give so much dividends. I think you add back the dividends, I, I, I'm, I'm in the green for Singapore stocks. I think the US exchange itself, um, I wouldn't say like I, I lose a lot of money. Sure, there are money losing bets, especially when uh, there, there was this spec hype, right? So I was essentially uh, speculating on, on specs as well, your special purpose acquisition companies. Um, those were the bomb that those days, right? Like $10 floor, floor price and then yeah. there's a lot of upside. I think in, in, in that aspect, I also kind of um, got burnt because I was swing trading the other time. But that was really a very small part of the percentage. Like, um, I think for Chicken Genius, he said it's the Ichi Hands portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. So that was under my Ichi Hands portfolio. Then I think one of the more critical lessons that I got the other time was when um, in the 2021 bull run, right? I bought into this company called Beyond Meat. I'm not too sure whether you know this company. Oh yeah, it was, it was yeah. pushed by one of the YouTubers. I think also Bill Gates also had a position in, in okay. Beyond Meat. So because it was this sustainability, um, um, pushing into the vegetarian space, into a sustainable world kind of kind of rhetoric and narrative, right? And it sounds so good, you know, like everybody don't need to eat meat anymore and then we have a much more sustainable world. So I bought I bought the stock at 70 and then they pumped it up to 180. Then wow. I was like, wow, then I, I sold it, but it was not a big position. I think I had like uh, 2,000, 2000 USD in there. Then I, I, I sold it and then I thought like I was the investing messiah, you know, wow, so easy. I buy, then I wow, immediately times two or yeah. times 2.5. 
So so that was then after that particular decision, then I started with going to specs because I thought money was so <laughs> was so easy and, and the stock market just flipped. So I think that was one uh whatever I got from Beyond it, I give it back to give it back to the stock market. Right. So rather than saying um was that a very it was a very incredible lesson in a way where I I, I opened my eyes into understanding that sometimes if you want to speculate or you want to trade, um try to limit yourself and try to have the discipline. So thankfully I didn't went all in into Beyond it. But um I, I think my philosophy and, and, and how I invest changed over time. And then also with uh, with how my, my dad looks at me, how I invest, and he will always comment. He was like, are you why you buy this? Are you why you buy that? And and what's my valuation? And I have to walk through it. So he forced me to sit down and think um, what I do. So, so I think that that's where, where we are. Lot. What did your dad say about you buying Alibaba? He said I bought in too early. I think at $200. Um, he's extremely bullish about it. Uh, the, the interesting thing, maybe I can share a perspective. I think from a Singaporean perspective, um, we are all extremely bullish about the China's economy. Mm. I think China, um, its economy, um, how it affects Singapore, um, we can see tangible differences. Mm. Maybe not so much at the West because they are quite shielded from what's happening there. But in Asia, at least in the context here, um, Singapore is quite, we, we are a price taker. So we, we are very affected by a lot of our big neighbours like Australia, China, Russia, etc. Then if you have to look at it, um, China is a very big trading partner to Singapore. We are all, or at least I can say most Singaporeans are quite bullish about the economy. But then um, having a booming economy doesn't mean that you earn money as a shareholder, right? right? So, so a lot of people are skeptical about the stock market. But I think for my dad, his position was that um, he thinks the stock market will probably, re- they will reward stock shareholders in the long run. But at least in, in this kind of tumultuous time, right? And when everything is crashing, he was saying, oh, he might consider buying at like $50 or something. <laughs> if, if it comes, it comes. If it doesn't, then he, he's not in, in search of a uh, very great opportunity because he, he, he do see um, quite a lot of um, um, investment opportunity in Singapore market as well. Right. So so he, he feel more comfortable um, investing in, in, in Singapore and also because he's older. So he's closer, he, he's already in retirement phase. So he doesn't want to take that amount of volatility risk in, in the US. Actually, he don't have to take the risk, right? He right. already have CPF right. payout. And and he focused quite a lot on like dividend income as well yeah. because he has no cash flow already. So that's the, that's the perspective. Yeah, so going back to Alibaba, what was the reason that you chose to invest in Alibaba? Right. I think also, I, I recently had another interview and, and um, I, I think I can categorize it in three, three core segments. Um, number one, I, I still believe that the China growth story is not done. I think we are, we are still at the, they like to use the, 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 the term, right? We are at the start of the S-curve. <laughs> I, think, I think we are at the start of the S-curve for China as well. I think there is still a huge propensity for them to grow. They are currently at like one six of US GDP per capita. Mm. I'm not saying that they're going to overtake in terms of per capita basis, but just based on the sheer volume of people that they have, the amount of innovation, the amount of businesses that come and go and the competitive, competitiveness in, in the country by and large. Um, I believe for those of you in Singapore, you know how competitive people from China are yeah. because they have such a huge population, you have to stand out. So that's the first part. I think the S-curve on China's growth and um, the middle income, getting people out of poverty, that is a huge circular tailwind in, 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 in itself because um, as people get richer, they, they get more money and then they spend more money. So that's, that's, how, that's how businesses work and that's how um, um, they're pushing out the entire industry. That's the first part. I think on the second part, right, for, for e-commerce specifically, um, I think digitalization and, and data and going online is, is the, the trend forward. It, we are probably already at the maturing stage, I think, for China. They essentially leapfrog. Like they, I, I think just to give an example, they didn't need to go through that credit card or that Visa card stage. Mm-hmm. They immediately went to digital payments and, and digital wallets. Yeah. So your Alipay, your WeChat Pay, everything just, everybody jumped. Then they'll be looking at you, huh, you still use card? Ah? What is card? You, you understand? So maybe from that perspective, right, it seems like innovation from on that front, um, they are extremely quick to adopt. And mm. adoption is a very big problem. I think in the EV space as well, it, it's, I think we are starting at the S-curve of, of that adoption. But I think in China specifically, they, they do have a very interesting societal makeup and how they, they essentially go into that space and how they try to disrupt a lot of the old tech in, in that industry. So I think Alibaba is quite positioned as a tech company to be able to exploit that curve. And I think the last part, I think it's just cloud. cloud. For Alibaba, it currently holds a very small, small percentage. Even mm. though it's a big player in China, but on the aggregate, on the international stage, I think they're still a small player and there are a lot of room to go. And right. I think recently there was this new graph, right? They intend to 5x or 10x China's market share in at least in the next 5 to 10 years. So so that's something I'm excited about as well. So Wait. these are the three main core reasons I bought into Alibaba. Okay. I saw that you mentioned that you bought Alibaba after the crackdown. Um, I think it was in the middle. I, I wouldn't yeah. say after. If, okay, okay, actually, now we are also in... In, in during the crackdown, right? Like now, there, there isn't really... I think it's sort of ended right now already, right? For now. <laughs> there, there is a slowdown, but yeah. uh, there, was this tweet, there was this tweet from Rui Ma. I think she, she 
she put it very nicely. I think the entire idea of this crack, quote unquote crackdown, right? We shouldn't look at it binary. So it's like got crackdown or no crackdown. I think I think it's really always a continuum, right? So it's a it's a not where the Chinese government decides yeah. crackdown more or crackdown less, but there will always be the iterations mm. of regulations because um things are moving too quickly. Um, businesses don't know what's going on. They'll keep pushing boundaries and they want to earn more money from consumers and, and try to generate more profit, right? And then it's usually the consumers that are the ones paying the price. They don't know whether um, too much data regulation, too little data regulation, um, whether is this a good thing for businesses? Is this a good thing for competitors? So we, we are always in, 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 the, in the idea of trying to morph a better policy or a better stance for, for, for both um, companies, for consumers and also for the government. But I mean, it's a work in progress, uh, if mm. I can put it that way. Recently, I went to check Alibaba's latest earning report. Right. And they had the slowest growth so far. Right. And they cited competition as one of the major reasons for right. the slowdown. Right. So my question is, like, after all the government crackdowns, there's like no more uh, main character, plot mm. armor. Has Alibaba lost its mode already? Okay. I think on that part, maybe I want to qualify for those of you who never, never really follow, right? Um, I think there are two core reasons and to the slowdown. And it affects all companies, by the way. I think even Tencent also reported the slowest growth in mm. I don't know how many years. It's always the headline, right? It's like how inflation is the highest in 30 years or 40 years. It shows yeah. the, 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 the magnitude and how um, they try to phrase or, or frame a certain thinking. But maybe there are two main reasons. One is on competition. Um, that's true. The second part is on macroeconomic factors. I think in China, um, in tw- large part of 2021, we're still worried about the property crisis, right? Lehman 2.0, Evergrande is going to collapse. But... Um, it seems like nobody's interested in, in Evergrande anymore. Now it's about lockdowns and about how, how the pandemic is being controlled in China. Yeah. So there is always something to worry about. And I, 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 I'm not going to kid ourselves. Um, it's true. I think there is some short-term headwinds in, in the Chinese economy, especially when they're trying to deleverage when um, there is so much easy money, which is why um, the stock price also kind of show um, the, the differences in monetary stance. And now um, US is uh, essentially kind of paying the price uh, when, when we're looking at how the market is reacting today. Yeah. So... In terms of uh, growth, um, that's a very huge explanation. Um, all tech companies, by and large, all kind of slowed down um, by a huge extent, especially those matured ones. I think only the younger ones like Meituan, TikTok, ByteDance, those kind have huge amount of growth because they are just starting out yeah. in, in, in terms of their growth. But matured ones, um, they're kind of slowing down. Then even Pintoto, for those, of, for those of us who are entrenched in the e-commerce space, right? we thought that they're growing the, the next up-and-coming rival to Alibaba. I think they recently only grow a single-digit growth as well. Oh. So it's it's... It's the e-commerce industry that, that is kind of slowing down and there are, there are quite a lot of issues that they have to work out with regulations as well. So maybe on, on top of like what you asked about regulations, right? I think an interesting perspective that people don't really look at is um, how I frame it because it's always in terms of framing the thinking, right? And um, we are all biased to a certain extent. So treat whatever I say with a pinch of salt as well. But one, one, one interesting fact or interesting research that I came across the other time was um, I, we, we believe that when the, the government cracked down or when the government is heavy handed on an industry, uh, people will start to leave, right? There'll be a capital flight scenario. Interestingly, in 2021, um, there's a record-breaking number of capital flowing into the venture capital space in China. So we might thought that 2020 peaked and then because of the crackdown, um, it kind of de- de- de-incentivized investors from going, but it continued going up. But the problem is now the proportion changed. So the proportion from tech companies changed into like agriculture, mm. changed into things that the Chinese government is interested in. So then when capital flight out of this kind of tech industry, then who's going to rival your Alibaba, your Tencent, your ByteDance? Because there's no capital trying to support right. um, these different companies. Then in, at first, um, they say that, oh, they want to provide a fairer, fairer playing field for all these different uh, companies, right? They want to encourage competition. But then no money wants to go in because they know that you're going to crack down again. So mm. how are you going to encourage capital in? So, so then this is just a different uh, a flipping of perspective into understanding the industry as well. So when there is no capital and like when you crack down on Tencent and then Tencent gave out all their JD shares or as dividends to, to Tencent shareholders, right? Nobody's going to back, even though they say, yeah, they're still going to maintain an agreement with, with JD and say, um, I'm trying to help them use uh, Tencent's ecosystem. But when it's not, you don't have skin in the game, what, what, kind, of, what kind of incentive do you have to, to help pump up the, or not, I wouldn't say pump up the stock, but help the business model in, the, in that sense. Mm. So then, um, there is this interesting saying or interesting phrase, right? The the way to the the road to hell is always paved with good intentions. The intention might be good, but maybe the outcome and the conclusion might might use usually slightly differ because mm. we are not living in a very idealized world. So I think that's that's um the my it, short answer is I don't think it kind of affects um economic mode. Sure, there are slowdowns, uh, margins are shrinking, but you also need to look at why are the margins shrinking? They're trying to increase, um, trying to penetrate into new business model, right. like how Amazon is also trying to penetrate into groceries, which is also um, quite low margins mm. when they when they kind of acquire. Uh, 
um, the different um, chain stores and etc. So I, I think from a business perspective, the economic is still strong. Um, the tailwinds behind it is still probably intact, but um, yeah, there are slowdowns that, that we can see. And more importantly, um, the crackdown, even though we like to think that it's going to destroy um, um, shareholders' value and destroy economic mode, um, some data actually prove otherwise. So right. we, we, we are still quite early into the curve and we, we can see how things play out, but I'm still quite hopeful. And, and if I'm wrong, then yeah, I'll, I'll take it as a lesson then. Yeah. One reason many people don't like to invest in Alibaba is because of government crackdowns. Right. So right now with Alibaba being one of the biggest company right now, how likely is that the government will hinder their growth? Like don't let them become too big and too strong? Okay. I think the short answer is I don't know. I think the biggest question in everybody's mind is really the, the, the crackdown, right? Nobody, nobody can put an exact number to, to, that, to, to this question mark here. So it cannot be like, oh, um, this is the intrinsic value. Because of the government, I'm going to discount 20, 30, 40%. Right. Um, people that say this online, is like, um, I don't know where they get their numbers from, probably pulling out from their ass as well. But, but yeah, I mean, it depends on that's why um, there's this idea of a margin of safety, right? If you don't know because of the uncertainty, then you try to protect yourself on the downside by buying it at a cheaper price, if I can put it that way. And I think also recently I saw um, a CIO of a local bank say that don't invest in China because um, regulatory pressures cannot be quantified. The risk of regulatory pressures cannot be quantified. I mean, I do agree to a large extent that we, we don't know how, how, how it works and, and how things will play out. But I think logically speaking, right, from, from my own perspective, I think I, I work on an incentive structure. So I, I would believe that the Chinese government is a rational player, even though I, I also fundamentally think that um, even like whatever that's happening in Ukraine today, I hope to believe that people that are doing whatever they're doing, they're all rational players. But um, sure, there are always tail end risks that um, suddenly C wakes up on the wrong side of the bed and decides to decides to kill off and nationalize Alibaba or Tencent. But personally, I don't think so. I think um, um, until the day that it really happens, uh, there is this Chinese saying, right? Put jing, guan cai, put lei, right? Un unless it really happens, I, I don't think, personally, I don't think on a fundamental level or on the foundational level, uh, the, the amount of value that they bring to the marketplace, the amount of employment, um, the impact of the economy and the products and services that they offer on a day-to-day -day basis, if you were to ask any Chinese people staying in China, um, I don't think it's that easy to replace and just uproot them and say that, okay, um, thank you. Thank you for your contribution and yeah, you can leave now. So, so that's not what I think. Uh. So this one, I had the same sentiment. Right. Chinese government is a bit like Singapore government in the sense that uh, they factor in profits as one of their motivation. Right. I feel that it's not likely that they will kill off Alibaba just became just because it has become too big. Right. Because they still can make money off Alibaba. Right. I, I think maybe I can add on, right? I think um rather than saying like making putting profits into uh, their consideration, I do agree. I think it's more of like being pragmatic. They're mm -hmm. very pragmatic people that they think how is the fastest way, the easiest way for me to leave people out of poverty? Or how do I reach uh, X goal? So for right. example, they have that like, common prosperity. Um, they have a lot of their socialism, um, what um, capitalism and Chinese characteristics. What's the easiest, what's the fastest way? To prove also that, to prove to the people in the world that, oh, Chinese government is efficient. So how do I make myself look good in the international stage? All these questions, I would presume that a lot of their advisors also are thinking about and how they're going to solve this, this problem in, the, in, in a very pragmatic and efficient way. So, right. so that was my yeah. two cents. What will make you sell Alibaba? Right. Um, so my deal breaker, right? In, in, in that way. Uh, my deal breaker, I think... Um, Personally now, uh, like the three tailwinds that I talked about, unless I can see significant impairment in the three tailwinds, that's because those three are the core fundamentals of my thesis, right? right. So if one break, like it's a stool, one break with two legs, you probably still can stand, but you move a bit, it will, it will, it will topple. So the three core theses, I will still monitor extremely closely. And then on the other part is the, the crackdown part, right? The nationalization part. I think people like to use the ad tech industry. They say that uh, for profit, for TAL, for Oriental, suddenly, boom, gone. But I think for, for EdTech or for the education company specifically, um, there was a lot of problems. I, I, I don't want to just brush it off and say that, oh, it's going to be the same or this time it's different. But when I looked into the issue and, and when a lot of you are following China, uh, the social fabric, how the education system is being structured, right? It, it, sing suan, uh, I, I can put it. I, I look at the children there and then I compare to Singapore. They're even more, more toxic yeah. than, than in Singapore. When Singapore is probably already one of the, the, the more competitive places and then you look at China, it's even crazier. So then I can understand where the Chinese government is coming from and I don't think it's like quote-unquote draconian. But then, yeah, I, I, I personally think that it's still, it's kind of acceptable if I can put it that way. Then if, if tech companies, um, if they're going to nationalize or, or suddenly I see that they, they, they start doing something crazy again, then it will probably be thesis breaking as well. Because I, I already said, right, um, I, I preface it in, in a way where I presume that there are rational players and there are a lot of incentive 
built into letting these companies continue prospering. Mm. So if they break that that um, fundamental or underlying assumption, then yeah, it's also thesis breaking. The reason you got into Alibaba in the first place is because of cheap valuation. Okay. Right. But let's say if Alibaba is three hundred dollars right now. Right. Will you still look at Alibaba, or will you start finding other stocks to buy? Okay. I think uh, maybe I want to qualify also um, because. I, I, I usually don't qualify myself like it's like a value investor or a growth investor, that kind of thing. I just follow a set of principles that I think um, is quite important. And to me, valuation is one of the very important factors that I look into. So being cheap on top of like all the circular tailwinds and economic mode and my assessment of the economic mode that is probably still intact, um, then I think that, hey, Alibaba might have a very good risk-reward ratio. So in terms of looking at other investments, yes, I, I am. I'm constantly in the lookout for new investments because... Uh, all right, we, we like to we like the idea of a sniper theory, right? We like to wow, all in and hot big big. But but then again, uh, we, we we understand that there are merits to some sort of diversification, and uh, we always live to play for another day. Right. We don't want to be permanently impaired, like oh, hundred percent, and then suddenly I lose fifty percent of my capital, and I have to exit because the fundamental change. So I'm constantly in the lookout. I I, I probably will release a watch list soon on my channel. So mm. if you're interested, you can you can go. Um, check it out. But I currently do also have a position in Facebook, even though it's much smaller than Alibaba. Um, Facebook is also another interesting take where people are start sh- has been shitting on Facebook for quite some time. And then that's why there is this joke on my channel that now, uh, my name is not Tay Chi King, my full name is actually Tay Falling Knife Chi King. So I, because I like to catch Falling Knife. But um, some Falling Knives are different from others. Um, there's a reason why I didn't catch um, Netflix. There's a reason why I didn't catch PayPal. And I caught Facebook and Alibaba because um, there, there was something that attracted me to, to that particular right. investment. So um, maybe another, before I release that video, another another two stocks that I'm actually quite interested in is Google and uh, Tesla, actually. Tesla. Yes, I'm, I'm actually quite interested in Tesla, but uh, valuation might be a problem for me. Uh, if, if it comes down to a cheaper price, I, I, I look at the mode. I look at how they're able to combat and they're so resilient in this economic times, right? I'm quite impressed with how things have been playing out so far. Yeah. So, so if it comes down to my price, then yeah, I might be a Tesla shareholder and all in Tesla. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Sell Alibaba by Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, if, if it's not thesis breaking, I don't think I will sell so easily right. um, until, until like, like I said, it, it appreciates to a significant extent. But I don't think so because we, we have a lot of problems that is still pushing down on the, the, the price itself. So, so just, yeah. just now you mentioned about Tesla being overvalued. But some people right. like Chicken Genius right. or, or you and me feel that Tesla is actually undervalued if right. you look at it from the point of uh, growth right. or PEG. Right. 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 What do you think? I think actually there, there are merits to the argument. So... Which is why I love the stock market is, is there is no correct answer. Right. Only time will tell who's correct. But I, I do agree. I think even Josh Tan recently, um, he also started dragging out the PG of, of Tesla. I think it's at 1 to 1.5 now yeah. because of that 50, 60, 70% growth rate when you divide the PE by. Then, then when, I, when I look at Tesla as a company, right, it's interesting because um, number one, it's so resilient. Number two, it has such a, it doesn't spend at all on marketing. And Elon Musk is just, a, I, I, if I can quantify him, he's a genius to me. Now. He, he, the, the way he, he conducts himself, the way he conducts the businesses, he's, he's, a, he's a blessing to, 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 to the world, I, I, if I can put it that way. But then, when I look at it from an investment perspective, right, I would still fundamentally believe that um, actually to all intelligent investing is, is, is value investing. So you see a value that I don't see. That's, mm. that's the difference. So it's not really in terms of, oh, because objectively it's a cheap valuation, that's why I buy a company. It's because you think that the market is mispricing something and you think that because Tesla is probably worth two, three, four, five thousand in the future, that's why you're buying at current valuation at one thousand, right? If you think that Tesla is gonna be five hundred, why are you gonna buy at one thousand? It, it doesn't it doesn't make economical and logical sense. So in this way, I think in terms of how we look at the value um, and, and how we value Tesla as a company, it's different. We we right. have, we, we take different perspective. Right. And it's seeing the two sides of the same coin. So so in that case, I personally um there are a lot of interesting prospects like FSD, energy, um, AI and robotics and whatever. Sure, I, I, I acknowledge all those um, s curves that's going to come. But then it's like um, pushing to like Metaverse. Now I look at Facebook and then I look at their Metaverse and I also don't know what the heck Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> is talking about. So, so in that case, I'm going to discount it heavily. Right. And I'm only looking at the, 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 the car business and the automobile business. And at a 20% margin, at a 10 million, 10 million sales in 2030, um, I can work out a, a decent valuation for Tesla, but not at today's valuation, of right. course. So then a lot of all the tail end things that I want to account for, it's based on my imagination. And I seem to have a little bit less imagination compared to the rest of the Tesla shareholders, which is why it's kind of stopping me in unlocking the value if I can, if I can put it that way. Yeah. So, so that's just my general take on, on Tesla as an investment. So here's a fun question. Right. 
Alibaba is dominating China in three out of, out of four segments, right? right. Like e-commerce, cloud service, uh, digital payments, right? Right. While Tesla as a tailwind because of mm. EV adoption mm. and stuff and mm. all the S curve going on. Right. So at the current price, right? Right. Which do you think will give the highest return in the next five years? Okay, uh, we don't know where the stock price will go in five years. If I know, I, I wouldn't be sitting here already. I would, I would be a, probably a trillionaire because I'll just borrow money and go all in. But I think, I think that's a very interesting question. It's a two different companies, right? I think for Alibaba specifically, they are also kind of, they are just at the start of um, cloud computing. Right. So they are, they are not even close to AWS, Microsoft, Azure. They, they, in China market especially, it's a very young, young um, um, industry. They haven't unlocked um, whatever their, their margins and, and they just recently just turned um, net net. So they're not really very profitable. I think their profits is like um, one one or two billion RMB or something. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. So so in terms of that value, they haven't unlocked it yet. You can look at the maturing e-commerce industry, but they are always, as tech companies, we are all searching for the new curve, right? That's how they try to differentiate themselves from all the older industries, if I can put it that way. So yeah, I, I do agree. Tesla has a huge, huge S curve. EV is a interesting interesting industry energy is a very important industry i think like how they say they're gonna unlock like trillions trillion dollars worth of value if if really you can solve it um, and and grow like 50 100 percent year on year um, I, I think it's something possible i wouldn't take it off the table so they are, they are of a different investment i wouldn't say that who is going to be who, who is going to be a better in terms of risk reward wise um i'm just afraid like i said right um, for for tesla for for it to be an interesting valuation to me um, I, I don't like to price so much execution into, into, into Tesla for it to be able to, to grow that much. Because mm. who knows what's going to happen? Suddenly, suddenly China says that they don't want Tesla to be in it anymore. And right. that's a very real risk. I, I think, I, think I, I, don't know, I don't know what's going to happen between the US-China tension. But let's say they're going to close Shanghai and say that. <laughs> let's, let's keep Tesla out of China. And, and then mm. that's a huge part of, of growth that's going to be erased away. So, so in, in that, from, from that perspective, I think um, there are a considerable amount of... Um, problems or issues that I personally am not comfortable with, so I'm not paying off. Um, if you really want me to, to, to say upside, right, I think Tesla is going to be uh, have a better upside for uh, compared to Alibaba in the next five years. Um, but downside equally as well, because we yeah. know volatility, right? right? So if there is a high upside, there's probably a high downside as well. So, so my, can... my problem with Tesla is, is pricing, it's already pricing in for uh, the kind of growth already. Right. So anything that they do wrong, right, right. <laughs> will immediately crash the stock price. Right. On the other hand, Alibaba has like almost priced in all the risk already. <laughs> right. <laughs> so like, can it go down even more? Can. Probably. What's the chance that it can go down more compared to it, the chance that it go back, go back up? But maybe if, if we look at it from another perspective, right? I think Tesla is more exciting than, yeah. than Alibaba. Alibaba is a name, oh, uh, Chinese government crack down, oh, uh, they're, they're not growing, etc. So it doesn't excite investors. So when it doesn't excite them, no, no, there is no ape to the moon, right? Like. <laughs> There's a, there's a reason why like, there's not a lot of people covering Alibaba on, on YouTube as well. So then, then begs the question, how are you going to position your portfolio and what, what kind of risk you're comfortable with? Then, which, which is why I say there is definitely quite a lot of upside on, on Tesla, personally, I think. But then there is also um, the band expands, you know, like, like when, you, yeah. when you have a high upside, you also probably have a high downside. So then Alibaba, it's probably it's, it's in a much smaller band. So, so then I think that who knows, maybe Tesla already 5,000 in 2026 or something. <laughs> who knows who knows <laughs> yeah. yeah okay so for the final question do you have right. any investment tips for notes like me no I, I don't think you're a note I think you've been covering finance for quite some time and you, you kind of know what you're talking about because oh, if, you can, <laughs> if you can if you can draw out like peg ratio and then stuff and ask me this kind of hard questions I think you are, you are, you are, you are, you are somewhere somewhere already I also wouldn't consider myself an expert because I'm clearly down quite significantly on my current holdings and people are just laughing but uh I think for, for, for especially for younger people and for people that are first time investing, I think um, rather than reading all the theories, right? It's like you you reading books on swimming. So yeah. I want to learn oh, what are my strokes and stuff. But if you don't go into the water, you don't know. Right. So even for people that keep saying that the cash flow is tight, um, oh, I by the time of the, there, there's this Chinese term called Yue Guang Zhu. So by the end of Yue, by end of the month, um, you spend everything. So you have no money. I think it's better to still at least like squeeze out and pay yourself first at least have that two three hundred dollars and then start putting into a broad based market ETF or even to pick stocks. Um, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't it's not financial advice by the way. I'm not advocating for it as well. But it, it trains your business acumen. It trains your it helps your investment journey and maybe your twenty like let's say you are twenty year old, twenty years later your 30, 40 year old self will probably thank you for starting earlier. Right. And to harness this skill set because I think it's a very 
um, under underappreciated skill set where people say that oh investing I can do it next time I can do it when I'm older I can do it when I have more money trust me when you're older when you don't start soon um, you won't do it because you'll just keep telling yourself that I'll do it when I have money then when you have money you say why I need to invest because I have money already so you get what I mean it's a it's a very interesting conundrum so if I can put it that way so start investing as early as you can right like you can no, like Warren Buffett he started at 12 so, <laughs> so, so, so that's, a, that's an interesting phenomenon yeah. okay Okay, once again, thank you, Tiking, for joining us in this interview. Uh, if you guys have not subscribed to him, do subscribe to him. He's actually much better investor than he looks. No, I, I don't think so. But, but yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, you can find me, find me on, on, on YouTube. Just type in my name. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there is, there is no learns investing or on investing. It's just my name. He already then, learns. <laughs> I wouldn't put it that way. But yeah, thanks, Kevin, for having me as well. Okay, yeah. See you guys. Bye-bye. Bye.